Good evening. My name is Justin Christian, and I am a member of the Dole Student Advisory Board. Uh, I would like to welcome you to, to tonight's program. On behalf of the Dole Institute, I have three requests. One, please turn off your cell phones. Two, we will have a question and answer session immediately after the program. If you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for a staffer to bring the, you the microphone. Three, finally, do not ask a, do ask a single question. Um, our director does not tolerate filibustering. It is my honor to introduce Barbara Ballard. She will now be uh, speaking with you guys. All right, Kristen, give it for Kristen. Thank you so very much. <laughs> Good evening, and I am Barbara Ballard, Associate Director, and I want to thank you very much for being with us this evening. We're very excited about our program and about this whole series. I'd also like to say I want to welcome you to the Dole Leadership Prize with Victor Yoshinko. You might wonder about the Dole Leadership Prize. For those of you who do not know, it has been presented annually since 2003. The 2011 Dole Leadership Prize is being presented to our recipient tonight for his leadership of the Orange Revolution from 2004 to 2005, and he is the second international leader to win this award. I also wish to recognize Brian and Barbara King uh, for their financial support, and we also wish to thank our co-sponsors, the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, and the Center for Global and International Studies. I would like to just say again, because of the transition, all the translation that's going on, please ask a simple, small question, because it may take a long time to get the question, and also, again, no statements. And we say that because everyone has opinions. We just don't want those opinions here tonight. So I would simply say, just ask the question, all right? It is now my pleasure to recognize Eric Heron, and he will introduce President Yoshinko to you this evening. Eric Heron is an associate professor of political science at KU and former director of the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies. He is currently on leave from KU to serve as a program director in political science at the National Science Foundation. Eric has traveled extensively in Eastern Europe for his research on international elections, including several trips to the Ukraine. He has served as an election observer in nine elections across the five post-Soviet countries. During his time in Ukraine, he had the opportunity to meet and make connections with politicians and political activists. This networking laid the groundwork for the Dole Institute to invite President Yoshinko here this evening. We want to thank Eric for being the architect of the whole series. Would you please give Eric a warm KU welcome. Thank you, Barbara. Seven years ago, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians rallied in the streets for democracy, the rule of law, and to show their support for our guest of honor, Viktor Yushchenko. Not since the Velvet Revolutions in Eastern Europe at the twilight of communism had we witnessed such large, peaceful, and important mass mobilizations. Viktor Yushchenko embodied the possibility of progress. He had worked in banking, become central bank director, then prime minister, and finally entered into the political opposition. In 2002, he led the opposition political party, Our Ukraine, to a strong showing in parliamentary elections. As the 2004 presidential election approached, he emerged as the leading opposition candidate. The campaign was brutal, and in its darkest moment, Mr. Yushchenko was poisoned with dioxin. Despite the challenges, he was victorious in the first round and faced the regime's preferred candidate in a runoff election. 
observers and the media witnessed massive efforts to steal the election from Mr. Yushchenko. And when the regime-supported candidate was improperly declared the winner, citizens of Ukraine, at great personal and professional risk, claimed the streets. They occupied the central square of the capital city in the cold for weeks until an agreement was reached. A new election would be held, and from it, Viktor Yushchenko emerged as president of Ukraine. These peaceful protests, labeled the Orange Revolution, inspired other pro-democracy advocates around the world and popularized the idea that color revolutions could threaten entrenched authoritarian systems. Our guest tonight will be interviewed by Dole Institute director Bill Lacey with interpretation by KU Zone Alex Siof and First Lady Katerina Yushchenko. Please join me in welcoming to the Dole Institute of Politics and to the University of Kansas, President Viktor Yushchenko. Mr. President, we're delighted to have you here to receive the Dole Leadership Prize for 2011. And I want to begin by asking you, what was it like growing up in your nation being dominated by the Soviet Union, and how did that motivate you to get involved in politics? First of all, good evening. And I would like to thank each and everyone that you are that your heart is not indifferent to our country and to our people. When they ask me how I looked in my childhood, how I could regard something that later would be, might be called politics, I remember two episodes in my life. Episode number one uh, that would repeat itself many times that every morning at about 6 a.m. Uh, my father had a small radio and the uh, antenna, the wires would go all around the house. And starting at 6 a.m. He would be leaning toward that radio and would be listening to the voice of America. <laughs> and of course, it was jammed. And uh, probably, I think, every other word was hard to understand with what they were saying. Because that was a voice of truth. And it really made a major impact on me. Uh, for a long time, I remember the programming, the schedule times for different programs. For the Voice of America, BBC, BBC the German Wave, Deutsche Welle, and there was a program from Israel, and they were broadcasting in Russian. That was, uh, as I would remember now, the environment in which I was growing up. 
І друге, те, що thing, можливо, в якійсь мірі спонукало, чи свідомо, чи не свідомо, uh, stimulated me to go into politics, maybe consciously or subconsciously. Я, я родився на сході України. You see, I was born in eastern Ukraine. 40 км від кордону з Росією. Uh, it was 40 km away from the border with Russia. Ну, як як і всі мої однолітки like everyone, uh, that I grew up with паскорів that паскорів uh, that everybody <laughs> I was a shepherd for cows there was said so quickly I thought it was in English <laughs> I was standing the cows <laughs> Uh, дуже важливо, щоб ви запам'ятали, що це схід України. But it's very important to uh, really for you to remember that it was eastern Ukraine. Це приблизно десь півтори тисячі кілометрів від Львова. That is approximately one and a half thousand kilometers from the city of Lviv, which is in western І Ukraine. І яр, у якому я паскорів. And that valley where I was uh, really sending uh, cows to the pasture. Називається по сьогоднішній день. It is called half lakh. Lakh is the the name of the Half lakh. На It is because lakh is the uh, another name for a pole. It was half Polish. That was the old name. А десь десь метрів вісімсот від цього урочища. And about eight hundred meters from that spot. Стоїть пам'ятник. There is a monument. Якому років 200? It's about 200 year old monument. І на ньому написано було. And it was written on that monument. Російською мовою. In Russian. Uh, it was a tradition back then. А uh, на цьому місці in this place проходила границя. There was a border між Польщею і Росією. Between Poland and Russia. І я стою мені сім Років, and I'm standing there and I am a six year old boy яр, and I'm looking at that valley and I'm thinking to myself там, за яром, там over there beyond that valley this is Russia До яру, before the valley it's still Poland думаю, where is Ukraine? what <laughs> last <laughs> Ці дві історії, я думаю, так. So, these two stories, можуть, I think, можуть дотепно розповісти про наші українські почуття. А uh, maybe, maybe they we I can share them and they in a witty way can describe our feelings uh, in Ukraine. Мільйони людей. Millions of people. За останні 400 років. In recent 400 years. Шукали і виборювали Україну. Were looking for their Ukraine and were struggling for their Ukraine. Я сьогодні вже говорив. I already mentioned it earlier today. Ви уявляєте почуття нації, яка you, Can you imagine the feelings of a nation? 400 років не мала своєї держави. Which for 400 years did not have its own state. Did not have state. А в 11 столітті ми мали найбільшу в Європі державу. And in the 11th century we had the state that was largest in Europe. Від Балтійського моря до Чорного. From the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea. Потім у нас украли назву Then our name was stolen. Країну. The country was stolen. Історію. History was stolen. Героїв. Our heroes were taken away. Постраждала культура. Our culture suffered as a result. 172 рази нам забороняли офіційно. Officially it was banned 172 times. The language was banned. It was prohibited to use the Ukrainian language for communication purposes. One could not hear to a liturgy in Ukrainian. It was prohibited to print books in Ukrainian. Це ті почуття, з якими от підходиш до оцінки нашого 20-ліття. This is the feelings with which one could regard approach the assessment, evaluation of our uh, 20 years. І так свідомо, свідомо стверджує, що And you really come to conclusion найбільшою мрією для мого діда uh, that the major greatest dream for my grandfather мати Україну was to have Ukraine. Найбільшою мрією для мого прадіда 
And for my great grandfather, uh, the greatest dream uh, was to live in his own state. The greatest dream of my father was to have an independent Ukraine. Now we have it. Of course, there are many shortcomings, there are many things that need rectification and improvement. And of course, it is hard to live in one home when that home was isolated, was divided into separate rooms for 400 years, and now it is one shared home. Ви знаєте, мені боляче, коли я чую, особливо, особливо десь за межами України. And it really hurts. I feel pain when I when I hear, especially internationally when outside Ukraine. Коли нам докоряють, що знаєте, шановні українці, ви дуже різні. Uh, you know they tell us, you know, our dear respected Ukrainians, you are very different within Ukraine. У вас є схід you have the east, you have west, you communicate using different languages, you go to different churches, uh, you do not have your shared heroes, uh, your history is one Crimean history, one is the Donetsk history, the third history is the Galician history. Uh, in, in, well, to sum it up, you are very different, diverse within Ukraine. And then I have this question. Look at the map of the 20th century. Look at the territory that today is Ukraine. Uh, it's been cut through by a dozen of different borders. Uh, and these were foreign borders. We lived the, uh, east of Ukraine lived as one colony. West of Ukraine lived in five colonies. And I am asking uh, is this our fault that we are different? So did we divide and separate ourselves within Ukraine? Did we ourselves go to different churches? Did we want to use the, some foreign language as our native language, as our mother's no. language? No. Uh, you do not, it's not the fault, you cannot blame it on my nation. We were divided. And my grandparents suffered because of that. Uh, today I already mentioned that example. Which other nation uh, did what I will mention now? Uh, within the 20th century, to speak specifically, more specific, starting with 1918 up to 1991, within the 70 years, Ukraine declared its independence six times. You have the Grushevsky Central Rada, Ukrainian Simona National Petlura, Republic, Simon Petlura, the Skoropatsky state, Vološina, the Augustine Voloshin Carpathian Ukraine, and the independent state of Stepan Bandera, and the independent Ukraine in 1991. Six times we declared our independence. And five times we lost it. And the reason was only one. And all those five times. Uh, foreign occupation or outside occupation. That's why I will say... These were the feelings from childhood, from adolescent years. Of course, with time it was modified, became more perfected in my life. I asked many questions. I asked myself, why did they treat 
Uh, why did they do these things to this nation? And it is very important to respect yourself, to respect your language, to respect your culture, and how important national revival is, uh, how important freedom and democracy are. And in the long run, one can say how important is this large surrounding world and integration into this surrounding world. Either we are talking about European integration or pan-European integration. Uh, that is the thoughts that I have starting with that half pole or half lock that I mentioned that valley. When I was really a very young boy. And up to the time when I won the presidential election. Mr. President, describe the transition you made from prime minister to opposition leader. And, and the personal risk that that entailed. <laughs> it would, I would not be honest with you if I said, didn't say that really I had major reservations. I did not want to go into politics. I thought that I had a good job and I was head of National Bank, which as you know is the equivalent of Federal Reserve. Central Bank. Central Bank. Central Bank. And twice I was elected for this high position, unique position. And I uh, introduced, implemented the uh, monetary reform. symbol. Because uh, I believe that the nation needs a symbol, symbol the symbol of stability, and uh, national currency uh, could be that symbol. And I really did not want to uh, go from National Bank. And for about six times they offered me the position of Prime Minister. And, and uh, I refused that post several times, but it appeared that the day did not, uh, that they easily took that refusal. Then comes the year 1999. And the economic situation was very bad. The country economically was in bad shape. And I see that that invitation for the post of our Prime Minister comes more and more important, more and more pertinent. And I buy the uh, air ticket. And I fly to Germany. And I'm fly and flew to my friend Tittmeier. And he was head of Bundesbank. And I thought that for several days I will get out of Ukraine. And maybe that pressure for appointing me taking the post of Prime Minister will kind, kind of sort of taper down. And the ambassador there in Germany says one day, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, as Chairman of, of, of the National Central Bank, Bank, the uh, President is on the lookout for you. President wants you, President of Ukraine. And I tell him, Tell the president that you could not locate me. And then uh, the next day, the ambassador comes and says, Mr. Chairman, uh, the president of Ukraine 
is looking for you. Скажи, скажи, что я с головой Титмайером. And I said, please tell him that I am with uh, Bundesbank ahead, Titmeyer. Поздно вечером приходит до меня в отель посол Украины в Німеччині. And late in the evening that same day to my hotel comes the ambassador of Ukraine in Germany. It was about uh, midnight. And then he says, Mr. Chairman, the president is looking for you. <laughs> if you do not call him now, then by the morning comes morning, I will no longer be ambassador of Ukraine to Germany. <laughs> Я набираю президента України. Окей, okay, I dial the president of Ukraine. Uh, ну, розмова повторюється. And again, that uh, invitation, the conversation, the topic is President пропонує прем'єрство, я відмовляюсь. The president makes an offer for prime minister post and I refuse. Температура якось піднімається в розмові. So I declined this invitation and the temperature in this conversation is going up. І в кінці президент мені каже таку фразу, яку, яка мене, чесно скажу, розслабила. And in the end the president gives me, tells me one phrase that really may influenced me and kind of I felt it loosened me up. Він каже, ти знаєш, яка ситуація в Україні? He told me, do you know the situation in Ukraine? Я кажу, дуже добре знаю. He says, I know it very well. Так от, каже, знай. Мені більше нема кого ставити. And then he says, so that you know, there is no one else I can put in that position of prime minister. Ви знаєте, цю фразу я сприйняв просто як твій обов'язок. And that phrase, that remark that the president made, I took it as my duty. Приїхав в Україну. And then I came returned to Ukraine. Мене обрали прем'єр-міністром. I was elected prime minister. Їду до своєї мами на східну Україну. And I go to my mother uh, home in eastern Ukraine. Вона мене зустрічає біля порога. And she meets me there outside on the threshold in our house. І от послухайте, що мама сказала. And please listen to what my mother said. В зв'язку з моїм обранням на посаду прем'єр-міністра. In connection with my election to the post of prime minister of the country. Каже, Вітя. She says, Vitya, the uh, endearment. Це якесь нещастя на наш рід. That is really some hardship, some bad omen for all our people. Оце я так прем'єр-міністром став. That, that is bad luck for our entire family. And that's how I became prime minister. Answering your question. <laughs> how did you make the transition from prime minister to the leader of the opposition? It was not complicated, I will say. After I was uh, in that position as prime minister for about a year, я погасив усі борги трьохлітні, які були перед пенсіонерами. There were arrears that we had, uh, the outstanding payment to the in pension fund and everything. I really managed to solve all that, and there were no arrears. Уряд почав регулярно виплачувати заробітну плату, що and, було тоді диковинкою для України. Uh, it's an exotic thing in those days that the government started paying wages and salaries regularly on time. І дуже на багатьох таких публічних заходах мені е, треба було бути з президентом Кучманом. And, and during many public events I had to appear together with President Kuchma back then. І я пригадую декілька таких заходів, коли And I remember several of those events. Ідеш з президентом повз там декілька тисяч людей. When you are walking together with the president and there are about several thousand people. І люди викрикують прізвище прем'єр-міністра. 
And when you are a company, you're walking with the president and the people who are there, several thousand, they are calling out the name of the prime minister, not the president. And then I understood that's the end of it. That's the end of me. And this is really what happened. Who would like that kind of prime minister who is more popular than the president? Especially in the country where there is good regime. Good regime. Good regime in quotation marks. <laughs> And on the 26th of April, the year 2001, there was an unprecedented event in our parliament. I, as prime minister, I was denied the right to come with a report on my performance. And they voted to dismiss me. We never had any event like that. Because the procedure in the entire world is the same. The person who the executive is reporting for his or her performance, then uh, answers the questions that uh, the members might have and then really gives the argument and supports his or her steps that were taken by this executive. And after that, the parliament makes this or that decision. But you see, the task was not to listen to the report of the Prime Minister and not to discuss, not to share the successes of the performance that were in Ukraine, but really put in an end to that person as Prime Minister. They really fired me and at that very moment the Parliament was attached to maybe a thousand and the entire parliament was surrounded by some 60 or 80, 60 or 80 thousand people uh, who came to defend their prime minister, to support and defend their prime minister. And then I walked out to address them after I was fired. And I told them, I am leaving to return. And in three months after that, I became head of the opposition. And that opposition, after one year after that, for the first time in Ukraine's history, and for the, by the number of elected members to the parliament, they won against the communists. For the first time, the members elected from the opposition outnumbered the communists uh, in the parliament. And I think that through these efforts, we came to really chart a new course for the country. That brought us close to the motivation and really we were inspired to part ways to say goodbye to the past, to the Soviet past, to the Soviet, to the Homo Sovieticus without competition, totalitarian. And of course I am telling all these stories with a touch of humor and with a touch of sarcasm. But, uh, because if you look at those things viewed from today, from vantage point of today, this is but an episode in the recent history. And in those days, 
it was perceived almost like an open combat. And please uh, bear with me, forgive for these long answers. Because I want to share with you my feelings, that you really understand my feelings. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, um, some have argued that the United States and other nations from the outside were responsible for the Orange Revolution. Is, is that the case, or did it come from the Ukrainian people? You see, in a way, we touched upon this question, that issue today. Uh, there isn't a single PR campaign in the world which would, at the expense of any money, uh, would bring out into the frost, which is 17-20 degrees centigrade, multiplied by 3.5 minus 17, you will leave you Fahrenheit. <laughs> Two and a half million people, 17, 20 centigrade is very, very cold, uh, would bring to the uh, square two and a half million people. Or otherwise, if you say 15% of the voting population, the people who had the right to vote <coughs> given their age and so on, one third was out there on the square. Хоча в Росії багато ходило легенд про те, що це робота американців. In Russia there were many legends, rumors circulating that that was an outside American job. Я поважаю Сполучені Штати Америки. I respect the United States. Але тут їх місія значно переоцінена. And really, their mission, the United States and their efforts, was way overestimated, <laughs> what they did in Ukraine. But because that was exclusively and only the energy of <laughs> my nation, of my people. It was really the understanding that it touches you as an individual, as a citizen, that this is really your issue that has an impact on yourself. There were before that 15 years of Ukrainian independence. Some recent 10 years or say 5 years, uh, that those were the years of havoc. Uh, those were the years of political tyranny. Uh, we lost many good people during that period. People suffered so much that they understood your fate is in your hands. We had one uh, outstanding politician, my friend, who is no longer with us, he was killed, Vyacheslav Chernovil. He wanted very much for me to become president, to run for president. And he is a very well-rounded, tactful person. Person, intelligent person who went through the Siberia, through Gulag. That is really a person who suffered for Ukraine, a martyr. And then to, to the entire nation, he would address the entire nation with one sentence. Remember, Ukraine starts with you. And I think that this realization of the fact that the fate 
of the country, the fate of the nation depends on you. It is in your hands. Не сиди дома, вийди. Don't sit around. Don't stay inside. Go outside. Але що окремо я хотів прокоментувати? And uh, separately I would like to comment on the following. Uh, я в першому турі виграв. In the first round of election I won. В другому турі через in, тотальну фальсифікацію. In the second round because of the total rigging and falsification. Експерти оцінюють приблизно е, фальшування в півтора мільйона голосів. А uh, the experts assess later that there were falsifications about one and a half million votes in ballots. Я другий тур програв. And I lost the second round or runoff. Почалося, почалося сотні, сотні кримінальних справ по фальшуванню. And there were hundreds and hundreds of criminal cases that were initiated on falsifications on rigged elections. Люди зрозуміли, що треба відстояти свій голос. And people understood that they had to stand for, defend their vote, their voice. Я по натурі взагалі людина комунікабельна. And I am really a person who communicates with people greatly. I mix with people. Я, я хочу обговорювати проблему. And I want to always discuss the problem. Але цього не хоче влада. But uh, the authorities do not want it. Президент тижнями на, на роботу не ходить. A president would not report to work for several weeks. Прем'єру заблокували дорогу до, до the, уряду. Prime Minister, Prime Minister's road to work to office was blocked. Конституція не каже, як в такому в такій ситуації поступати. The Constitution does not say how to act under such circumstances. Бо Конституція не передбачає третього туру. Because the there is runoff and there is no third round of elections according to Constitution. Словом, there was no provision in the Constitution about that. Словом, Здається, інструментарій вичерпаний. So it appeared that all the tools at hand, all the mechanisms have been used up and nothing is available. Громадянське протистояння. And then there was the protest. Громадянська війна. A civil war is in the air. Сирійський варіант. That is Syrian variant, a variant of situation in Syria. Я набираю своїх друзів. Uh, and under those circumstances, uh, in that context, I'm dialing my friends. Олександра Квашнєвського. Олександр Квашнєвський. І кажу, нам треба діалог в Україні організувати. And I'm telling him we have to start to have a dialogue in Ukraine. Нам треба третя сторона. We need a third party. Ми повинні прийти до столу. We have to sit down at negotiating table. Демократія дасть відповідь на те, як вийти з Democracy will give an answer how to find a way out of this situation. Але треба зустрітися з президентом країни. But for that we have to meet with the president, with the prime minister, have a discussion with them. Він говорить, я згоден. He told me, okay, I agree. Я прилечу. Okay, I will fly to Ukraine. There is Alexander Kwasniewski. Візьму декілька друзів. I will take several friends with me. President Adamkus. I will take President Dankus. Uh, Javier Solano. Javier Solano. І ми приїдемо до тебе. And together with Adamkus and Javier Solano, we will come to Ukraine, come to you. І так почалися перемовини. And that's how negotiations started. Які привели до пакету. That led to a, an agreement, to a packet. З одної сторони, я значну частину повноважень президента уступив. On the one hand, I would, I yielded uh, a major part uh, of the authority and power of the president. Бо та друга половина, звичайно, більше всього боялася повноважень президента, таких, які були президента Кучма. And because that other party, most of all, they are afraid uh, of the powers of the president that Mr. Kuchma enjoyed. Я леву частину повноважень президента передав премєр-міністру парламенту. And I gave away lion's share 
of presidential powers to the prime minister and to the parliament. Взамен друга сторона визнала неконституційним результати другого туру. And in exchange the other party recognized as unconstitutional the results of the runoff elections of the second round of elections. Це було рішення Верховного суду України. That was the decision of the Supreme Court of Ukraine. Але його не визнавала та сторона, яка представляла владу. And but it was not recognized by the, by the party that represented the power of the authorities. Кінець кінцем ми три ночі до п'ятої години ранку. In the end for three nights in a row up to 5. Ми вели дебати. O'clock in the morning we were debating у рамках цієї міжнародної комісії. debating within the framework of that international commission. І на четвертий день знайшли And on the fourth day we found політичний вихід. A political way out. І я думаю, що це було колосальне торжество демократії. And I think that was really really a major holiday for democracy. Коли на Майдані ми не мали жодного ексцесу. When uh, in Maidan, that main square, there was not a single violent act, not a single unwelcome event. Жодної каплі крові не не пролилося на Not a single drop of blood Maidan. was spilled there. А я смію стверджувати, що влада цього чекала. And I can make a statement now, and I know that the authorities, the government were waiting for that for blood to be spilled, to have violence there. Я вночі зустрівся із начальником штабу внутрішніх військ. And I met in the middle of the night with the chief of staff of our internal troops. І попросив одне. And I asked for one thing. Якщо не буде письмового наказу вивести війська, if there is not a written order to withdraw troops that were deployed, не приймай рішення, не підкоряйся усним наказам президента і міністра. To send in the troops, to deploy the troops into the square, then you should ignore the oral decree or oral orders either of the president or the prime minister. To send troops in, to deploy troops, you have to have a written, signed order. Він мені дав слово. And he gave his word. Війська він виведе тільки тоді, коли буде письмова вказівка. And he gave his word that he would send in troops only on condition внутрішніх справ. Uh, there is the written order by the Minister of Internal Affairs. Internal Affairs in Ukraine, as you know, that is law enforcement, police, and so on. А я чомусь був переконаний, що наш міністр Білоконь And I was convinced, I was certain that our Minister Білоконь побоїться підписувати наказ. Would really be afraid that he would not give his own written and signed order. Кінець кінцем, знаєте, я гордий і щасливий, що от ми пройшли такі іспити через In the end, через... I am proud and happy that we went through those tests. Все таки через круглий стіл. That we really went through round table negotiations ми, that we had. Ми знайшли відповідь для нації. And we find an answer and solution for the nation. Ми відвели від протистоянь громадських. We really avoided the civic, uh, pro- uh, civic uh, disobedience and confrontation. І повторю, це ще раз показує. And again, I would repeat that it indicates. Який колосальний арсенал. Shows once again great arsenal. Механізмів, інструментів. And potential of the mechanisms and tools that democracy has at its, at its disposal. Нема проблема, яку через демократію не можна було вирішити. There isn't a single problem that cannot be resolved through and by means of democracy. Вибачте, ще ще раз за довго. Again, forgive me for a long answer. I thought that was a very compelling answer. Я рахую, що це дуже прекрасний, дуже сильний відповідь. Mr. President, uh, what are the lessons of the Orange Revolution and what are the future prospects for Ukraine? Uh, 
Orange Revolution is a festive occasion, it's a holiday. Я пригадую, як за мною стояли керівники, можливо, 20, можливо, 25 партій. I remember how the leaders of 20, maybe 25 political parties were standing behind me on stage during Orange and in the end of Orange Revolution. Вони були різні за ідеологією. Uh, those parties, they were different in their ideologies and their platforms. Uh, they saw, looked in different ways in their concepts how to build, continue building the country. Uh, they saw different ways, different roads for Ukraine to take. I'm not saying that this is someone's fault. But this is just the truth. We are quite different. Ну, наприклад, там, For example, соціалістична партія. Socialist party. Я добре знаю, що українська соціалістична партія. I know very well that the Ukrainian Socialist Party. Це по суті комуністична. That is basically in its essence is communist party. Це не та ідеологія, з якою я живу. This is not the ideology that I share, that I live with. Я знаю, що вони не приймуть дуже багато багато засад. And I know that they would not accept. Наприклад, many. відкритої економіки. Factors, for example, they would not accept open economy. They would be leaning towards some kind of sweet, populistic social justice, again, quote unquote, which would be sweet and populistic. In my opinion, this is the ideology that does not know, does not have the answer how to really develop and acquire a resource for the nation. Але яка завжди хоче ділити. But which always wants to divide and split and share. І це вважає своєю основною місією. And it always feels that this is main mission. Другими словами. In other words, Майдан це не партійний проект. Майдан Square is not the party project. Той чи якоїсь іншої партії. It is not a project of this or that or any given party. І тому that is why перші мої складності my first Difficulties, first complications. It was my duty to then accommodate the leaders of different political parties, political forces that were with me on Maidan. And I had to give appointments to them. It was a very complex dialogue. Ideologically complex. And egocentricity, egoism of many political demigods. Unfortunately, talking in terms of party and party policies, there were few things that united us. There were about a dozen, dozen and a half of party statutes that programs that would outline the purpose and the objective for each political force. And that's why I can say that that was my first lesson. It's very important for this society uh, to have a dominant ideology. And for that it is necessary for each citizen can formulate more clearly uh, their own system of values. What are you? Who are you? Either you are a liberal or you are a social democrat or you are Christian Democrat, you are conservative. What is the system of your views, of your values? What kind of values you want to hand to your children? And it is very important from the standpoint of forming a community. It's impossible that one person goes this way and the other one goes the other way. And we are talking about this society, about the nation as a community that start breathing together, consciously knowing what they're doing. 
суспільство. And this is major work that has to be done for the sake and for the benefit of the society. Друге. Second. Я не мав більшості в парламенті. I did not have majority in the parliament. У мене було в парламенті, я думаю, десь голосів 40. And I had about 40, 40 votes in the parliament. Я не знаю жодного президента, який був в таких умовах. And I do not know a single other president who could really be working without uh, any limitations, any shackles under such conditions. Але мені прийшлось півтора року працювати з більшістю кучми. But I had to work for a year and a half with the majority that belonged to Kuchma, to a previous president. Де очевидно сказати про спільні делегеми, спільні плани. Then at that, under those circumstances, it just was impossible. It is simply out of the question to discuss a shared vision, shared ideology, shared concepts. We didn't have things in common. І тому от слабка структуризація суспільства привела до того, що в парламенті в нас багато років панувала стихія. And that really it was the ad hoc arrangements that were dominant in the parliament for many years. Це другий урок. Третій урок. Я думаю, що надзвичайно важливо мати lessons learned number three. I think it is very important гарну структуру to have a nice structure of to defend, to safeguard democracy. What I have in mind, I, justice, the just court, honest law enforcement, honest police, провести через парламент належні реформи цих інституцій. Know how to vote for in the parliament for proper honest reforms using parliament as a tool. То що демократія повинна бути своя структура. In other words, democracy has to have its structure. There should be infrastructure in the state. Яка захищає, власне кажучи, свободу. That really protects and safeguards freedom. І закон and law. That probably was the most difficult thing. My drafts that I submitted about the judiciary reform that I submitted for approval, they would never really be considered, never reached the floor in the parliament for three and a half years. And the packets to combat corruptions, three drafts that I submitted for laws. For three years were not reviewed, were not debated by the parliament. That is lesson number three. Well, okay, I will stop here. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to open up to your questions and answers now. Uh, we should have a couple of students emerging from the office. Who has microphones? Wave, get the students' attention. Don't try to get my attention. And please do ask a very direct and very quick question. Do we have any questions? Okay, Jen, over here to the right. Hello. How do you assess the possibility in the future, and what are your views on that, of the possibility of joining Ukraine, joining the European Union, or asking to join it? Долучення України в Євросоюз, які яка можливість, які перспективи на найближче майбутнє? Ви знаєте, ми за п'ять років пройшли на мій погляд непогану дорогу по Євросближенню. In five years, I think we managed to cover a long way, good way, in other words, coming closer to EU. До 2008 року, до жовтня місяця, up to the month of October 2008, ми прийшли до домовленості про перше. We reached the agreement number one. Україна буде асоціованим членом Європейського Союзу. Ukraine will be a associate member of the European Union. Друге. Number two. 
Україні буде запропонований режим зони вільної торгівлі України Європейський Союз. Free trade zone in Ukraine would be introduced between Ukraine and EU. Третє, ми приступаємо до переговорного процесу щодо безвізового режиму громадян України до Європейського Союзу. We start the negotiating process for visa-free regime for Ukrainian citizens and EU member countries. Мені чомусь здається, що в грудні цього року ми можемо отримати політичне рішення про асоціоване членство. Сто відсотків цієї роботи ми вже зробили. Ми вже зробили 100% to make this happen. Ми в цьому році можемо отримати статус зони вільної торгівлі. We this year we can get the status of free trade zone. І е затвердили дорожню карту переговорного процесу по безвізовому режиму. Uh we already approved the road map for negotiating process for visa free regime. Якщо ви якщо ви пам'ятаєте от режим для країн, які в третій, в четвертій хвилі приєдналися до Європейського Союзу. If you remember the regime for the countries that became EU members in a third and fourth wave. То це якраз був інститут асоціонованого членства. And really they went through as a step becoming full member through the institution of associate membership. Тому цю частину роботи, я б сказав, я оцінюю досить високо. So I think this part of work, this part of exercise I value rather highly because we've done that. Що мені не подобається? What I do not like. Не подобається те, що власне ми не отримали європейської перспективи. That we really did not gain, did not as a response, did not get the European perspective, I your reaction from Europe. І думаю, що в значній мірі це відповідальність наших європейських колег. And I think that the responsibility here lies with our European colleagues. Якщо ми дивимося на Литву, Литовців, Естонців, Поляків, Чехів, Словаків, Румен, Мадьяр, Болгарів, з 90-го року, що найбільш спонукало нації, уряди? Старting with the year 1990, What was the major impetus, major attraction for those countries, for those governments to implement domestic transformations? One circumstance, the European perspective. Мені розказував Олександр Квашнєвський. Олександр Квашнєвський told me. Як він десятки разів проїхав всю Польщу. When he crisscrossed Poland a dozen times, і закликав націю продемонструвати невелике терпіння, and he called upon the nation to demonstrate a little bit of patience, ради одного, for the sake of one thing, досягти європейського членства, to become a EU member, to gain EU membership. Це був генератор для нації. It was a generator, a major. Locomotive for the nation that pushed forward. За сім років я декілька днів назад був у Білій Криниці. Several days ago I was in Біла Криниця. Це економічний форум міжнародний. The International Economic Forum in Poland. International Economic Forum in Poland. Поляки стали п'ятою економікою Європи. Called Біла Криниця, and the Poles became the fifth. Economy in Europe ranked number five in the entire Europe. За сім років отримали двадцять сім мільярдів безповоротної грошової допомоги. In seven years, they got twenty-seven billion monetary support that they did not have to repay. Тому що на початку була чітко сформульована європейською командою європейська перспектива. From the very beginning, by a European team, European club, the European perspective was formulated. In clear-cut terms. На жаль, Україні це було відмовлено. Unfortunately, Ukraine was denied that. І мені гірко говорить про Бухарестський саміт. I feel bitterness when I talk about the summit in Bucharest. 
Це ми говоримо вже про наше наше інтегрування до НАТО. А now I'm talking about our NATO integration. І нам було відмовлено у плані ПДЧ. А we were uh, denied in action plan in roadmap. Я думаю, що то був великий програш для Європи. And I think that that was a major defeat, a major loss for Europe. Я зрозумів, I understood що тоді that then рішення приймали не члени клубу. It's not the members of the club that made that decision. Що рішення приймалося не по відповідності до статуту НАТО. And that that decision was made not in accordance with NATO statute. Рішення приймалося в іншій державі, яка And навіть не є членом НАТО. Decision was made in a different country, in a different state, which is not even a NATO member state. Це було гірко і, і було принизливо. And it was really, it was bitter, and it really belittled us. Але це така політика. But this is the kind of policy. Okay, do we have a question in the back? Can you make a comment uh, or give examples of the attempts of Russian government to influence events in Ukraine? To influence? Events yes. in Ukraine. Чи приклади можете, коли є російський уряд хоче здійснювати вплив, впливати на події в Україні, які зможете навести приклади? Скільки в мене є годин для відповіді? How many hours do I have to answer this question? <laughs> Ви знаєте, якщо бути серйозним, okay, seriously speaking, то мені здається важливо усвідомити, що для Європи and it's important to realize that for Europe, найбільш складною проблемою the most complicated problem, є наявність двох ідеологем розвитку. Uh, there are two ideologies or two concepts for development. Хтось на Сході Європи хоче жити в імперській ідеології. Somebody in Eastern Europe wants to live in the condition of the imperial ideology or the imperial mindset. І прикладає все належне для того, щоб ці цінності торжествували. And applies every effort for those values to reign supreme. Чому виникла російсько-грузинська війна? Why the Russian-Georgian war was started? Як трапилось, що за останні там, 30-40 років після Хельсінської угоди in uh, 30-40 years after Helsinki security agreement яка закріпила територіальну цілісність which really had a provision article і стала основою two or three uh, inviolability territorial integrity and recognition of the borders of the state і стала базисом міжнародних стосунків після and Другої світової війни became the foundation served as the basis of international relations between the countries after the second world war Що трапилося, що ми перший раз програли How come what happened that we lost for the first time територіальну цілісність одної з європейських країн territorial integrity of one of the european countries імперські амбіції imperial ambitions Грузія стала меншою на 20% своєї території. Georgia became smaller, shrank by 20% of its small of its previous territory. Утворилося два маріонеточних режими. Two puppet regimes were created. В Південній Осетії і Абхазії. In South Ossetia and in Abkhazia. Але Європа прийняла до відома це. And Europe just reacted to that okay we'll take that into account як виникла україно-російська газова війна how come that what are the reasons for the uh, ukrainian russian gas war to start чи хтось міг у європі наприклад там 10 років назад could anyone in europe say some 10 years ago думку впустити just start an idea що серед зими that in the middle of winter на православне різдво when you have orthodox christmas Росією може бути відключений газ для всієї Європи that russia can shut down a gas for the entire europe 
Я думаю, что 10 лет назад просто никто не мог уявить. I think that 10 years ago such an idea could not occur to anybody. Таким чином, одна частина Європи. Thus one part of Europe. На на моє бажання хотілося, щоб вона була більшою завжди. And it, it is my candid wish that I want for that part of Europe to be larger. Востребує демократичну систему цінностей. Really subscribes to and wants the democratic system of values. Можливо, не так амбітно її реалізовує. Maybe it is not implemented as ambitiously as it could. Але йде цією дорогою. But it's really following that way. І це одна правда про Європу. That is one truth. About Ukraine. Друга частина yeah. Європи. About Europe. The other truth about Europe. Переконаний, що це є меншість. And I am convinced that that is a smaller part. That's a minority. Ще живе в епоху імперських амбіцій. Still lives in the conditions of imperial ambitions of imperial mindset. Я все робив для того, щоб Україна стала на сторону більшості. And I did everything in my power for Ukraine to join that. Majority that shares and lives with European values. Мені чомусь здавалося, що у європейських лідерів буде більше амбіції щодо поширення демократичних цінностей. It appeared to me, and I thought that European leaders would have more ambition to really spread and expand that area of European values. Але не все, не все, не все це справдилося. But not everything uh, came true. Not everything was implemented. Те, що стосується України, as far as Ukraine is concerned, ну це список, відверто скажу, непростий. Uh, that whole list, as I would say, is not a simple one. Без валідолу його так не прочитаєш. Without heart medicine, it's hard to read it. Але я декілька позицій цих нагадаю. But some of the positions of that list I could remind you. Мені неприємно відчувати як громадянину. For me as a citizen, it is not pleasant to feel that що є рішення Державної Думи Росії that there are decisions passed by the State Duma of Russia відносно 93-го року. Uh, going back dated 1993 that the Crimea is not Ukrainian territory. Мені неприємно, що є рішення, що місто Севастополь. It's unpleasant for me to know that there is a decision. Є російським містом. Uh, made by that same entity that the city of Sevastopol is a Russian city. Що є рішення Ради безпеки, яке до сьогоднішнього дня по цих двох постановах не скасовані. Uh, that there were decisions of the Security Council that have not been cancelled up till now based on these two decisions, i.e. the status of Crimea and the status of the city of Sevastopol. Мені якось неприємно було, коли із Ставропольської сторони насипали дамбу до нашого острова Касатузла. There was a dike that they were building from the Stavropol, i.e. from the Russian side, where there is a narrow strait between uh, Russian territory and Crimea, they were building a dike in the direction toward Ukraine. Мені не затишно, як президенту, як громадянину, що за 20 років з Росією ми так і не провели демаркацію кордону. And it is really, I, it doesn't bode well, doesn't sit well with me uh, that within 20 years we did not carry out the demarcation of the borders with Russia. Мені неприємно, що за останні 6 років And у нас it's було really, I'm not pleased that in recent six два years серйозні газові конфлікти. There were two major serious gas conflicts with Russia. Де прийти Україна не має вини. And the fault there does not lie uh, with Ukraine. Uh, Є багато інших обставин, про які And there are many other можливо, мені б навіть не хотілося говорити. Like Бо я все-таки розумію, що із сусідом треба жити гарно. Because I understand that you're with your neighbor, you have to live well. Але як це здається, американське прислів'я чи I think it's можливо, когось із Європи там. American saying or maybe somebody from Europe said that. Чим вищий забор, тим the higher is your fence, the better is your neighbor across the fence. <laughs> we have time for one last question tonight, right here.
деякі ваші питання, які ви вирішили, скажімо, одне з них, оскаржувалося таке сенситивне зробити бандеру, проголосити національним героєм. І його роль в Другій світовій війні. Чому ви чи могли б пояснити, чому було таке прийняте рішення, а Стефан Бандера не можна було сказати. Дякую, що в нього зв'язки були з нацистами. Він звинувачився в цьому, так би. Я це ж таке чув теж. Yes, I also heard something like that. Ви знаєте, ви виглядаєте дуже молодо. You see, you look very young. І скоріше відноситися до покоління вже слідуючого після мого покоління. And you, it seems that you belong to the generation that follows, goes after my generation, after us. Якщо в Україні от звернутися до молодого покоління. And if you ask uh, people who belong to younger generation in Ukraine. Людям, яким 20 років, 25 років. To people who are 20, 25 years old. Це мої діти такі. А, these are my children like that. Тому я можу таке питання ставити. That's why I can ask a question like that. Скажи, будь ласка, які твої герої? Ask that young person, tell me, who are your heroes? Хто із національних героїв тобі близький по духу? Who of the national heroes is close to you in their spirit? Я хотів, щоб відповідь була швидка і повна. I would like for that young person to give me a quick and complete answer. Думаю, and для, I think для багатьох мільйонів українців це ще важке питання. For many millions of Ukrainians, it is still a difficult question to answer. Для багатьох, for many, Павлік Морозов, Павлік Морозов was a Soviet time and all time hero. Я думаю, що ви знаєте про цього героя. And I think that you know about that hero. Це дитина, яка зрадила свого батька. That was hero who really betrayed his father, who reported, who told on his father to the authorities. Або називають півдесятка чи десяток героїв, які очолювали червоні розбійницькі загони. And there is about a dozen heroes who were at, standing at the head of red banded uh, teams or troops. У кожній нації повинні бути свої герої. Each nation has to have its respective heroes. У кожній нації повинна бути власна історія. And each nation has to have its own history. З чого складається історія? What does history consist of? Не сюжетні про кохання. It does not consist of different plots and love stories. Історія будь-якої нації складається із сторінок боротьби за свою незалежність і свободу. And the history of each nation consists of the pages of its struggle for its independence and for freedom. В кожній національній історії є власні герої. In each national history there are their own indigenous heroes. Героєм може бути тільки той, хто боровся за твою незалежність. And hero can be, can be only the one who fought for your independence. Я вже вам розповідав історію I already told you декларації про незалежність України у 20 столітті. Story about six declarations of independence by Ukraine uh, that Ukraine made in the 20th century. А хто такий Степан Бандера? Who is or who was Stepan Bandera? Яке зло він приніс? What kind of evil he brought для тих, хто його проклинає? For those who curse him. Що він натворив у роки війни? What did he do? What which bad things he did during the Second Що World War? До сьогоднішнього дня that up till now з одні з великою ненавистю згадують. Some with great hatred mention, mention his name. А інші з великою любов'ю шанують. And others mention his name with great love and respect. Я розкажу вам про своє прикладання. I will tell you about my persuasion, what I believe in. Кажуть, що Степан Бандера, як ви її запитали, They, some say that Степан Бандера, as you mentioned in your question, був німецьким посіпакою. Was really collaborant, collaborated with Germans. У мене тоді до вас запитання. Then I have this question for you. 
Скажіть, будь ласка, що він робив з липня 41-го року? And please tell me, what did he do starting with July of 1941? Сидів у німецькому фашистському концтаборі Дакценхаузен. He was imprisoned at Dachsenhausen, which was a fascist team, a camp. Що робив Степан Бандера у 42-му році? What did Stepan Bandera do in the year 1942? Які антилюдські поступки він зробив? What kind of anti-human or inhuman acts? Він сидить, вибачте, в тому самому концтаборі Зексенхаузен. Was in the same concentration camp Zexenhausen. Що Степан Бандера робив у 43-му році? What did he do in 1943? He is still in the concentration camp. What is he doing in 1944? Up till the month of October. He is in the concentration camp. In the fascist concentration camp. Where are his two brothers? In 1942, they were executed in the concentration camp of Svensson. Where, under the number 11,357, that was the number of my father as the prisoner in that camp. Where is Bandera's father? He was executed by the firing squad by NKVD. Where are his two sisters? They were sent into different concentration camps in the Siberia. So are those German or fascist collaborators? If you want, I can give you an answer. Why Stepan Bandera was a prisoner in the concentration camp? And even more accurately, I will not say what he did, but I will say what he did not do. Саме головне, що він не зробив, the most important thing that he did not do, він не відмовився від декларації про проголошення незалежної української держави. He did not give up this declaration. He did not backtrack from his declaration of the independent Ukrainian state on the 30th of June 1941. That declaration was made on the 30th June 1941 in the city of Lviv. That shows him demonstrates that he was a fighter for our and, forgive me, as well as yours, independence. Stepan Bandera is a hero. Regardless of who treats him how, regardless of how, what kind of attitude people have to my decree making him Proclaiming him a national hero. Regardless of attitude towards my decree, he was a hero, and that's the person who gave an oath to the national liberation movement of Ukraine. Those were my motives, that those were my rationale to issue that decree making Bandera a national hero. I understood and I understand very well that there would not be one way simple unilateral reading of my decree by my nation. This is today. In 15 years from now it will be much more simple. Нелегко сприймуть частина людей, а можливо більша частина людей в Україні. I know that some part of people, maybe majority in Ukraine, will not have that same equal attitude towards. Коли я говорив про when I was talking єдину державну мову українську. When I was talking about one state language for entire Ukraine, де ми говорили про те, що шановні українці вчить десятки мов світу. And when we were telling, please, our dear Ukrainians, learn dozens of languages of the world. Communicate using dozen languages of the world. 
Але вас не забудьте, що є і національна мова. But please do not forget that you have your own national or state language. І вона одна. And it is one. Для французів французька. For the Frenchmen it is French. Для португальців португальська. For the Portuguese it is Portuguese. For the Germans it is German. For the Poles it is Polish. And so on and so on. Я знаю, що більшість мене зрозуміє. I understand the majority would understand some would not understand. Сьогодні. Today. Але в майбутньому. But in future. Вони зрозуміють. They will understand. Бо я правий. Because I am right. Я думаю, що мене не зрозуміють частина людей про те, як важливо мати націю одну помісну православну церкву. And maybe some part of people would not understand me how important it is to have one orthodox unified orthodox church. Як мають одну православну помісну церкву Росія? As one orthodox church is what Russia has. Греки. The Greeks. Болгари. Bulgarians. Грузини, вірмени. The Georgians, Armenians. В Україні чотири православних церкви. And there are four Orthodox churches in Ukraine. Якщо в духі, у вірі ви не об'єднані, скажіть, будь ласка, що вас може об'єднати? If you are not unified in the spirit, in your faith, in your religion, please tell me what else can serve as a unifying factor. Ми ж не тварини, ми ж люди. You see, we are not animals, we are humans. Ми ж приймаємо рішення не тілом. We make decisions not through our body, but through our mind, with our soul, with our reason. Так чому в Україні не повинна бути помісна церква така, як є в Росії? Why Ukraine should not have the one church as they have in Russia or in Greece and Bulgaria, one unified Orthodox Church? Ми пройдемо цю школу національного діалогу. We will also go through that period of the national school of national dialogue. Але я допускаю, що Частина суспільства, можливо, навіть більша частина. But I understand, and I can make that accommodation that maybe part of the society, maybe even larger part of society, will not be able to understand me for quite some time. Чи коли я говорю, що наше місце в Європі? Or when I say that our place is in Europe? Ми повинні війти в єдину європейську. That we belong in Europe. Пан європейську безпеку політику. That we have to become members of pan-European security system. At first, maybe even larger part of people did not share my opinion, my vision. Today, the majority of people support that idea, share that vision. Я думаю, що через декілька років суспільство це зрозуміє. I think that in several years the society will come to understand it. Знаєте, президент, якщо він керується державницькими темами, державницькими цілями. The president that has as a statesman looking at the objectives and interests of the state, а не партійними, чи кар'єрними, not a certain political party. Or career, personal career, and so on. Людина, яка повинна на півкорпус сидіти поперед. That a person, that kind of president, looking, having a big picture, and being motivated by the interests of the state, should be half a step ahead, half a step ahead all the time. Куди ми повинні рухатися? And show the way to the nation in which direction nation has to go. Вибачте, це не завжди з оплесками сприймається. And please understand. That it is not always taken with applause. But at that initially, but later, it is really perceived much better with one's reason, with one's sober mind, and then with one's soul, body, and so on. This is the system of complex social relations. This is the system of complex social relations. Some think about the state, а другі думають про слідуючі парламентські вибори. And others think about the next round of elections to the parliament. У кожного своя дорога. Every person, all people have their own way and their own objectives. Дякую. Thank you. Ви можете рок шок до кінця сказати, коли вам дрифтить. Так, 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 даю, даю, даю. 
Mr. Mr. President, I want to thank you for all the time you've spent at the University of Kansas today for meeting with uh, over nearly 60 students at lunch, for the opportunity to meet with our financial supporters, have dinner with administrators, and then join this wonderful group tonight. And it is my great honor to present you with the 2011 Dole Leadership Prize. Thank you. Dear guest, I would like to thank you for several things. First of all, you are amazingly patient people. <laughs> to be sitting for really for such a long time and to really care and listen with attention, it touches my heart. And second, Rock, Chuck, Jay, Hawk. I wanted to thank the Dole Institute and the University of Kansas for really that compliment, the assessment of my work. Although talking uh, previously, earlier today, I'm, I'm now I'm past that age that I take compliments so easily. <laughs> but uh, really, uh, your evaluation, the way you valued what I did is uh, really dear to me. Because really it inspires, it gives you strength. It really gives you energy. Uh, sometime ago, our great genius and our prophet, thinker, Taras Grigorovich Shevchenko, in the year 1840, he published his first outstanding work of genius that was called Kobzar. And you see, all the poems were under his bed in a box. And he was not really thinking about publishing them. And one of his friends came and said, Taras, please give me, give me to read what you wrote there. And he pulled out those pages, those separate sheets with poems from under his bed. Said, I do not even want to talk about publishing them. I do not want for them to be published But his friend was very persuasive. Taras, he said, you do not understand anything. He told him, you know, you know nothing about poetry. We have to publish your poems. <laughs> And it was pub those poems were published. And this became our second Bible. Uh, After ten, ten years passed by, and Shevchenko writes this note, when he says the following, After ten years, Ten years passed by, and I did not hear from my nation a single word regarding that work. I was not waiting for any praise or compliments coming from you. I was waiting for a piece of advice from you. And with this word, I, was, I would like to uh, finish, conclude my long address here. 
And I would like to thank you for the fact that you are not indifferent to my country that I love and to my nation that I love. That uh, you give today may be most valuable that thing that is this energy. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. We greatly appreciate your support. We're going to try to get the president of the first lady out this way as quickly as possible. Вийдуть а президент і перша леді зараз якомога скоріше. Всі почекають стоячи, за ким ви вийдете. Thank you very much. Дуже дякую. 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 Д